Long live the king, Brian. I'm James Whittingham. This week, my son's geology prof says there's not enough lithium to go 100% electric anytime soon. I have promptly advised my son to quit university and educate himself on Facebook. This week, California didn't have enough power. While other grids in the U.S. have so much excess power, prices are often going negative. If I can get the grid to pay me to use my fancy coffee machine, I'll be rich. Tesla's production cost per vehicle is 42% of what it was just five years ago. And it's not due to falling battery prices. It's actually due to Elon Musk not having to buy horses anymore due to the woke mob. Okay, I don't understand that, Joe. Really? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he got a massage and promised a woman a horse. Oh, that's <laughs> right. okay, cut. The California power grid avoided severe blackouts after sending a text alert to citizens. The text said, You up? Followed by, Turn off your lights. All that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. And Brian, this week we also have uh, something from Bloomberg Opinion that says the energy transition and its supply chain uh, are at what we need to beat climate change already. It's already being constructed. Even uh, apparently remarkable. lithium. Yes. <laughs> High temperatures are making people angrier online. And uh, how are you this week? I'm good. So here's my two updates. I got the latest full self-driving update on my Tesla, which is... Is uh, it a big one? Yeah, it's a big one. 10.69.2. This is only the... This is the first update I've had since actually getting the, the full oh, self-driving. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's the only one I've had since getting the full self-driving uh, okay. software. Um, only had it a day, only used it once. And it still did that same thing where, you know, a lot of our streets are don't have a line painted down the middle. And it's mm -hmm. two lanes, but uh, and it started to drift to one side, so I canceled it and, and just kept driving. Oh, um, well, joy. Yeah. And he says they're going to be out by the end of the year. Come on. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of the testing miles have been done in California, so it sounds like the software works way better in California. And we are, sadly, many, many miles from California, so, um, you know, it's going to be a bit of a, a struggle here for a while, I think. Do they paint the streets of California? Is that the issue? Do they um, paint them here? Yeah. Well, I'm assuming all the roads are better in California, but, you know, the grass well, is always greener, as they say. Yeah. Although not during a drought. But anyway, um, my other update. So I think I said last week I've applied for the Greener Homes Grant, which is Canada's subsidy for um, retrofitting your home to put in clean energy stuff, insulation. And uh, I'm still hoping to do a, um, a heat pump an air source heat pump for my house, get rid of my furnace. So the process is moving. I've been approved. I'm in the program. Um, they can't do the blower test. So what they do is a blower test on your house to test the tightness of the house. Yeah. And then you do the upgrades and they do another one. Um, but we are part of, because our ceiling, the drywalls opened up in the ceiling in the kitchen because we were trying to fix those leaks. They, they can't do the blower test right away. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that I am hoping to go through this process. This is what it's available in Canada. And as we've covered on the show before, the new Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. If you're in the U.S., there's lots of kind of similar subsidies for home improvements and upgrades and energy efficient appliances and vehicles and everything. So, and of course, different states and different provinces all have incentives too. And like our natural gas utility has a little bit of incentive to go to higher efficiency, you know, furnaces, gas furnaces and stuff. So um, anybody listening, uh, always check your local area, your local state, your local province to uh, see what the possible subsidies are. Okay, well, the Chevy Equinox, they finally announced the um, the uh, the uh, the specs on it, eh? Yeah, so this, so this is, is a, the next a big, big deal. electric vehicle from General Motors, which is an SUV that's going to be at a reasonable price. Yeah, they said uh, this is a small SUV under $30,000 US, which is, oh, is that cheaper than the Bolt? It's, yeah. it's not cheaper than the Bolt now because they lowered the Bolt in the US, but... yeah. 
it's <laughs> the equivalent Canadian pricing would put it lower, I think, than the Canadian pricing, current Canadian pricing of the Bolt and that, worldwide as well. Yeah. And if that's the price for the Equinox, one would think they would eventually drop the Bolt below that because that's a, a smaller yeah. car. Which, you know, makes me, this, the Equinox is actually making it hard for me to buy a Bolt because of two yeah. reasons. One, it'll render the Bolt obsolete. Yeah. Uh, if even if it's really close in price, it's a bigger yeah. vehicle. Yeah, it's, it seems it's like a better not vehicle. As, it's not as well, um, you know, fitted. Uh, maybe they have some, you know, bare bones stuff with the base model. Uh, there's no, there, you get a power driver's seat on the base model of the Bolt and a few other nice things. You get 10 years, in Canada, you get 10 years of connectivity or eight years of connectivity, a long time of connectivity. Maybe it's five, but it's a few, it's a few years that cover most of your ownership usually. So I'm just worried about it, you know, like it's just going to, plus they, they got the, the Altium battery pack with that. So it's so that should going be an to charge faster, three yeah. times as fast, yeah, peak yeah. charging. Doesn't mean that it's going to charge three times as fast, but the peak charging is three times as fast. So that's that's what the big drawback of the Bolt is, well, its size and its charging speed on the highway. Well, and I think we're still in a situation where if you decide you want one, you're going to have to head down to GM as soon as you can and kind of put down a deposit because, I, you know, the supplies are going to be limited, especially yeah. where we live. So I think that's going to be the situation for the next couple of years, no matter which um, electric vehicle you decide to buy. And it's it's going to be at least two years before I get a base model of the Equinox. But let's say I, I have a four-year loan or a four-year lease of a Bolt. Uh, yep. Maybe leasing is the way to go because the, the Bolt could be under severe price pressure. Right. If the price does go down and I, I bought the vehicle and I've got like a dud on it when I'm trying to sell it in three or four years to get an yeah, Equinox or something Yeah, but at least would give you a sort of a guaranteed buyout price or something. Yeah, but the lease, they're not too sexy with their offers on the leasing right now, so I, I really don't know what to do. Uh, yeah, so I got a, a message from my son at his uh, geology class. Um, it's not basic geology, it's engineering-related geology of something that is requisite that he's taking, and he says... The prof was going on about not having enough lithium. Like this was the day that California solidified their 100% uh, electric vehicles by 2035. Well, he says there's no way, no mm -hmm. way in hell, because there's not <laughs> enough lithium. He's a geologist. He knows there's not enough lithium. Uh, that's not true, though. No, and it's, it's uh, from what I understand, and um, I'm not a lithium expert, but apparently you are, um, <laughs> It's not so much that there's there's plenty of lithium, it's the processing of the lithium that's the difficult part to make it usable for batteries. Yeah, so I looked it up and I found some sources in the journal Nature and lithium itself is not scarce, as you said, but a June report by Bloomberg New Energy Finance estimated that the current reserves of the metal are around 20 million tons, metric tons, uh, and that's not enough to carry the conversion to EVs through to mid-century. So yeah. the actual, you know, amount there, it's the refinery of yeah. it. And, you know, the mining of it, you know, he said it takes 10 years to mine to get. Well, we're, we're more than, uh, 2035 is, <laughs> do your math, it's more than 10 years away. Yeah. So, and we're going to have a story later about the solar supply chain going gangbusters enough to actually beat climate change. And, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And this is what's happening. Solar is ahead of everybody else, but batteries are coming. No, and there's money to be made. So presumably if there's money to be made, um, you know, it, it seems plausible that there will possibly be some lithium bottlenecks where we won't have all that we need. There was an announcement from Tesla recently that they are trying to get a lithium mine or processing plant going in Texas. So the fact that Tesla is getting into it indicates that, you know, maybe they are worried there's not quite enough lithium. Um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's all part of the ramp. So I'm, I'm not worried, but you know, Hey, I'm not a geology professor. And we're also going to talk about Tesla having an advantage because, you know, five, seven years ago, Musk was talking about lithium and he was on top of this, wasn't he? No, I mean, this is probably, yeah, this is the, um, advantage of Tesla is they've been working on all of these things for at least a dozen years now. And, um, you know, they've got a nice head start in figuring this stuff out. Well, um, last week, Brian, 
we were ta- we were just before we went to uh, record. Yeah. Uh, there was a threat in California of uh, power blackouts, wasn't there? Yeah. So they've got a crazy heat wave going on there, and they were predicted just at the time that we were recording. Um, they had managed to stave off blackouts for the previous couple of days, but it was all coming to a head just as we were recording our show last week. And they saved the grid. And how did they do it, James? They sent out a text message alert. Yeah. <laughs> and Brian, it worked. It totally That's worked. That's the crazy thing. It worked. People said, okay, I yeah. will I will turn off my grow up for a couple of hours and um, or whatever they do in California. And it worked. Yeah, no, I thought that was quite remarkable. There was um, some graphs posted online of like exactly when the text went out and how power dipped. And um, I mean, obviously not everybody's going to listen to that, but that is one of the advantages of everybody having a cell phone. Here in our province, we had a bunch of emergency alerts for safety reasons um, a a couple of weeks ago, and they were quite alarming to get. um, But definitely necessary for everybody's safety. You certainly, I want to be informed of stuff like that. So if you and I were living in California, we would absolutely have gone and turned off some lights, turned off some uh, power hungry things. And clearly enough people think like us and did that as well. So I've got a pool pump running, right? Yeah. It's about a thousand watts. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> Swimming pools are not the most environmental thing. They're a bit hidden <laughs> niche. Yes, fact, although you do I, run yours with thermal uh, solar panels. So I heat it with solar, yeah. But there's chemicals and water, and um, I, I should probably do an assessment of that and compare it to having a hot tub, because maybe a hot tub is more my thing. I like the the freedom from gravity, Brian. That's what <laughs> right, I really yeah. enjoyed in the last couple of years is the freedom from gravity. Because yeah. the fatter you are, the lighter you are in water. So I figure I weigh about as much as I would on the moon. And can you put a bunch of salt in the water and be even more buoyant? You could, but I would, I would, you, I wouldn't be able to touch the ground, and I don't think I would be walking around floating like a bob, <laughs> bobbing up and down like a buoy. Uh, that's a horrible sight, especially in my speedo. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the situation, and I, I, you know, it's I, I just bought a bunch of chemicals even after I closed the pool because I had to. Uh, I have to keep it treated until it freezes. Mm-hmm. And then in the spring, I have to treat it again and kill all the LJ. And, 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 you know, so it's, you have to do that with a hot tub, but it's, it's, you know, less. But yeah. then you heat it and I can't heat it with, you can heat it with solar panels, but I can't heat it with my thermal heating. Anyway, the pool's closed and winter's here. <laughs> and that emergency alert that we had in Saskatchewan resolved itself. The person was caught and died in custody for what it's worth, but I won't dwell on that. The fact is, Brian, 500,000 homes in California and businesses had been warned that they might lose service. And within five minutes, it was all but over. That's all it took is five minutes. Yeah. I mean, you, maybe people are more conscious of, you know, energy demands these days. And they'll, I mean, we never used to think about it before, but maybe now it's not such a crazy thing to send out a text. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe they'd run into problems if they were sending out one of these alerts every couple of days. Eventually people would get tired of it. Yeah, but if they could limit true. themselves to once or twice a year then they can keep people's attention and they'll they'll do it. Maybe we'll have smarter homes. Like maybe, like my pool pump runs on, you know, a smart timer, a smart switch. Yeah. Maybe if I connected that to the power utility it will, I, and allowed it to turn off, you know, things like that. I don't know what else it would be. My air conditioner thermostat goes up a degree. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Well, actually, Apple has announced a new feature coming, I think, with the next update of their uh, iOS, their mobile software is Apple's actually going to have a thing where it, your phone will only charge when there's the maximum amount of green electricity on the grid. They're going to figure out. That's cool. Why don't we have a story about that? What's wrong with you? (laughs) You're the Apple guy here. This is it right now. This is our story about it. So everything. um, Presumably it will figure this out for each jurisdiction because the, the grid is different every, every place, but uh, yeah, it'll figure out when there's the most green power on the grid and it'll only charge your phone during that time. You see, phones take a lot of power now. They take 20, 40, 50 watts. Uh, some tablets take 100 watts. Yeah. That's uh, getting a little bit more serious, especially since, you know, we don't have 100 watt light bulbs anymore. We have LED light bulbs. That... No. And when you think about, you know, um, pretty much every single human being, in North America has a smartphone. Uh, that's a, that's a few hundred million smartphones just in North America. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a lot of juice when you add them all together. 
But I've said this before on the show that I wanted to know, when's the greenest time to charge my car? Yeah. Because we live on a, a, a power grid that has 45% coal. Yeah. Something like that. And I want to know, is, am I, am I, you know, like, is there more hydro in the mix at three in the morning than say if I plugged it in and charged it at seven in the night or something, or, you know, even during the day, the business day. And I couldn't get a response from the utility SAS power. Yeah. I want to know that. Um, yeah. I don't know if they know that. I hope they know that. But yeah, that's a very interesting question. So we'll have to see if Apple figures out our jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious. Maybe uh, maybe they'd listen to Apple and not you. Yeah, well, maybe Apple figures it out, but, and then we'll all learn from that and know when to, we'll, you will know when to charge our cars, you know, because all electric cars have preset timers on them that you can do. A lot of them you can do from an app. And I do my, I don't have an app for mine, but I, because I bought the base model, but I do uh, set a timer on it every time. And by the way, I think my car needs service. I've determined that um, I need a wheel hub for my uh, Nissan and it's going to cost me four or five hundred dollars um, because uh, it's noisy. Oh, yeah. And I went on YouTube and I figured out because it, it gets louder when you turn the wheel in one direction, so it's putting more pressure on the bearing. Right. This has been going on for a long time, and I thought it was my crappy tires that I bought, but it's probably this. So that will make my EV driving experience a lot more pleasant. I think our government's giving us $500 for inflation, so I'm going to put that check towards fixing my car. The only thing is I don't want to go to the Nissan dealership. So there's other people in our town that have EVs and they've been going to like a EV certified place. So yeah, I think that might be a cooler option to go to than the actual grotesque dealer because yeah. they are grotesque. I went there once <laughs> uh, and acquired it and, and they said, no, we don't do EVs. And then uh, next thing you know, I'm getting oil change notifications, <laughs> calls for service. And I, th yeah, I've told you this before. They'll call and say, James, you know, you're due for service for your <laughs> Nissan. I said, but you guys don't service electric vehicles. And they went, oh, sorry. Bye. Yeah. Millions of Californians, though, received these alerts uh, that the grid was in peril. Millions of them, right? Yeah. Millions. Interesting. I just wonder, though, like, if we can integrate, in, integrate, <laughs> integrate, well, I can't, integrate our homes into the power grid better because we're getting smart meters on our house. That's, you know, so that tells the utility what's going on faster in real time. Uh, you know, and maybe they can say, well, Joe Schmo at 1200 uh, Fifth Avenue uses a lot of electricity between five and seven uh, and he's uh, crashing the grid. Maybe, uh, maybe he could cut, find something to cut down on. And maybe they wouldn't send an alert to somebody who has, you know, a trickle of electricity because they're gone during that time. Well, that makes me want to skip ahead to uh, one of the stories we were going to have uh, this week, again, from Bloomberg. And this is about negative power prices. And I've heard about this in the UK and um, in other jurisdictions, but I didn't realize it was happening uh, quite so much in the U.S., and so this definitely relates to what we're talking about now. And I think basically the, you know, what you're just asking about here is basically the grid just isn't smart enough yet. It will eventually get there and it's also not interconnected enough. So in the U.S. there is uh, seven different utility grids and they're not all connected. It's basically seven regions of seven grids. And so... In certain places at certain times, there's excess wind and excess solar, so much so that they have too much power at certain times of the day. This results in negative pricing and encouraging people to just use extra power. And, you know, this, if, if the grid was further developed, was smarter, um, there's more um, home batteries connected to the grid, there's more EVs connected to the grid, and all of those can go either into the grid or out of the grid you know, that's going to eliminate these problems. So uh, once you start hitting negative prices, boom, that's when your car charges. That's when your home battery charges. Um, and it's coming. It's, you know, it's just going to take a long time. I thought we'd, I thought we'd talk a little bit about Tesla this week because sure. uh, there's a lot going on and it's, it's kind of interesting. One thing that I, I, I'll start with is a, a bit of information I, I learned on Twitter and that is, you know, how supercharger pricing is creeping up, right? It's it's getting more and more expensive all the time. 
that Tesla sets the price for their superchargers. Yeah, it was super cheap when I got my car two and a half years ago. It was almost nothing, just a few bucks a charge. And now it's more like 15, 20 bucks a charge, Ouch. which, you know, is annoying, but it um, it's still way better than gas. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, now they're saying that uh, the it's now the equivalent of a 30 to 40 mile per gallon gas car, which isn't even that great. Uh, cause yeah. you know, the Prius does 50 miles per gallon. So it's saying it's like that. Yeah. Well, the, but that's supercharging by the way. No. I mean, so remember the... you, you don't always supercharge. You mostly charge at home if you can. Yeah. So that's the caveat there. Yeah. 95% of the time or even 99% of the time you charge at home. So yeah, it sucks to pay that much when you're on the road, but still uh, way cheaper than gas. Yeah, and electricity is is usually a lot cheaper at home. Plus, you, if you're like us, you have the option of making it even cheaper by if you can invest in some solar panels and you have a, a good enough situation with your local utility. Yeah, Martin Avisha, the pre vice president of investor relations at Tesla, said Monday during a presentation at the Goldman Sachs Tech Conference in South San Francisco that Tesla currently has all the supply it needs. This is courtesy of business insider. This is an interesting statement. This is a, a shift from never, Tesla's never has, an, it's always supply constraints with their yep. batteries. Now they have all they need. What happened? Well, it's just all that groundwork that they laid is, is starting to pay off, which is, you know, they basically just saw this coming before everybody else. And it, it's an obvious thing to you and me. It's like, okay, well, the world needs to get off oil. So what do you do? You got you do the math and it's like, well, guess what? We need an insane number of batteries. And Tesla figured this out 10 or possibly as much as 20 years ago. And so they've been working on this problem for 10 or 20 years. And uh, they're just far ahead of the game um, because that's always been their ethos is it's like, well, no one else is doing it. So we have to do it ourselves since they were the first ones up to bat, as it were. So, you know, they've just got a, a big head start. And you know, the other players are figuring it out too. And as we always say, there's uh, announcements every week of new battery factories and, and such. So um, it it's, yeah, I, it's just, uh, it's as a Tesla investor, it's great news that they are not constrained by battery supply. They're, they're buying them from everybody that will sell them, you know, CATL and Panasonic and, and as well as, you know, just starting to ramp up their own batteries. We're hitting the S curve of EV adoption and it is constrained by supply. Yeah. Uh, I, if I want to order the Bolt, I have to wait months and yeah. like, you know, stuff like that. It's not just a chip shortage, right? Yeah. And I think there is still a bit of a chip shortage. So uh, it, they didn't say, like the last I heard was that uh, the chip shortage was the limiting factor for Tesla. They had enough batteries, but they were still a bit iffy on the number of chips. But this more recent statement suggests, okay, well, maybe they've got enough chips now. Well, the statement says, for the first time I can remember, we can access all the supply we need for both businesses. Uh, so, yeah, you know, 10% of their batteries goes into energy storage, both for the grid and for homes and businesses, smaller, you know, the mega pack and the power pack. Uh, this is something startling as well. Uh, the price of manufacturing is only 42% of what it was five short years ago. And it's not due to battery prices falling as expected. It's due to factory design and large castings, like making one large piece of the car instead of a whole bunch of little ones. Yeah. Efficiencies like that. Yeah, though it's, um, you know, all the stuff they set up 10 or 20 years ago is starting to pay off. That also makes me think they're making a killing on the markup. Yeah. So the cars that they make in, um, in, in California at Fremont are a lot more expensive than China, obviously. Yeah. Um, Sandy Monroe thought they'd be 20% less in China. Uh, but they say also in Germany, they're cheaper to make in Germany as well. Yeah, just because it's the new factory with the new design. Their original yeah. factory in Fremont was something that they bought from somebody else and kind of had to repurpose it. And that kind of gave them the knowledge to, okay, if we're going to build this stuff from scratch, what's the better design, the more efficient design? And that's what they've got in Texas and, and uh, Berlin and wherever else they might uh, be building in the future. Yeah, so we have uh, Tesla factories in China, in California, in Austin, Texas, and in Berlin, Germany, and who knows where else um, down the line. But those are the main ones that are coming online and starting to 
to hit their stride in production, right? Yeah, and really, I think that would be the case if any automaker was kind of starting up now. Like, the problem that the legacy automakers have is they've been in business for a 100 years, and they've been doing things a particular way, and and the businesses have grown in a particular way. And they don't have the luxury of just blowing everything up and starting over again and building new factories. They've kind of got to jerry-rig it as they go along. So that turned out to be Tesla's big advantage was, you know, the ability to start from scratch like that. Of course, it meant, you know, they nearly went bankrupt several times. But, you know, once they passed, once they got over the hump, it, it's all gravy from this point. Well, I thought it was interesting to know that 10% of their batteries are going into storage because we had a, an email about that last week. I think there's an insatiable demand for storage as well, obviously. Oh, yeah. It's just a matter of price. When the price hits a certain point, it's going to go crazy because, you know, the grid is, is greening and we need that storage for it. Yeah, and from what I understand, they would maybe do more than 10% of the batteries to storage, but the profits are just way better in the cars. So 10% yeah. is all they can manage right now. But, um, you know, eventually more batteries, more grid storage, etc. So you're basically just selling the batteries with a little bit of equipment, mm -hmm. whereas the car is the batteries with a lot of equipment. And so the markup comes from the bigger spend. So, yeah, that's it's quite remarkable. And it makes me think that the other manufacturers might be further behind than I thought, which is good if you're a Tesla investor like yourself. Yeah. Because the demand for electric car, man, I, I tell you, I see so many Teslas. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking it's you, and it's never yeah. you. It's never you. No, I, I was driving with my partner the other day, and I said, look, I have an announcement to make. I'm now going to stop pointing out every Tesla that I see because it's just become too annoying. <laughs> I used to do that. Hey, there's a Tesla. Hey, there's a Tesla. Uh, no more. So, yeah, if you're new to the podcast, full disclosure, I am a Tesla investor. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, that's actually a big announcement, Brian. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I haven't stopped doing that. <laughs> and my daughter hasn't stopped doing that. And sometimes she'll text me, Tesla. Just, you know, <laughs> just that's what she'll say in the text. Yeah. She's, <laughs> it's the punch buggy of our time, really. It's exactly, yeah. So uh, the Supercharger version 4 is uh, apparently being set up uh, in Arizona with a mega pack. That's the grid size, uh, truck container size storage of batteries and solar, which is something that Elon has been promising for years that all superchargers would have a solar installation, either adjacent to them or right on top or around them. No, that makes sense. We always see those renderings of, you know, the car park of the future where there's solar panels you park underneath to protect your car from rain, but you also get some free solar charging. So, um, yeah, eventually I think most car charging spots will include some solar. It's probably never enough to actually, you know, fully supply the cars, but that's fine. So we don't know the speed, the maximum charge rate of these new chargers. In fact, has there even been an announcement on it? I mean, what do we know? No, we don't know too much other than, you know, these are going to be prepared for um, cars other than Teslas, more so than the other ones. Um, there was going to be maybe a second cable, but now it's sounding more like it would be an, ad an adapter. There'll be an adapter included with each one. So we think every Tesla charger can be adapted to charge non-Teslas, but these ones are going to be designed. I wonder way. how they'll do that with the adapter so people don't steal them because they're worth hundreds of dollars. Will they? Yeah, I guess, you know, hooked on with a wire or something. Maybe lots of video know. cameras too. So we and don't know the charge speed, but we what was the maximum charge speed of the version 3? It's currently 250, but we believe that even on the version 3 chargers, they can probably up up it to 300, 350, but they haven't done so it So most yet. of the uh, third-party chargers that are out now, the non let's call them non-Tesla chargers, do 350, like the Electrify America. Or they're capable of 350. They don't yeah. do 350, but they're capable of it. Future-proofed. Yeah. That would imply that 350 is not too difficult. That's based to on the voltage, I think. So uh, supercharger... V4 is out, and yeah, I guess they'll start testing them and, and maybe announcing what what exactly they do. Uh, we Everybody sort of expects that they'll bump it up a little bit, maybe, perhaps for the Cybertruck. What do you think? Yeah, like up to just 300, or 300 or something, or something. You know, more than what they have now. Yeah. 
you know, my car is limited to 170 kilowatts, and I have not found that to be a real problem um, on the highway trips. So I think 250 is fine, 350 is fine, you know, whatever they can do. So they're they're cranking out, Tesla's cranking out 6,500 power walls. This is the battery packs for home storage uh, a week and 9,000 battery packs a week in Nevada. Um, well, this the, the battery packs are 9,000 in Nevada for vehicles per week and 6,500 power walls. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. uh, people are going to start buying these suckers and battery prices, you know, have to go down at some point. If we don't run out of lithium, geology professor, uh, they're testing new side repeater cameras with a wider, wider field of view. What do you think of that? What's the deal with that? Is it, is it anything to do with self-driving improvements or is it just a feature to, for coolness for like just having a better surround view of the car? I would think it's probably both. I mean, there's always going to be upgrades. There's always going to be new camera modules, modules available. So, you know, why not move to the new ones? Okay. So you talked about the, the grid prices going negative. Um, this is something that I wanted, you know, every now and again, Brian, a Twitter thread uh, blows my mind, explodes my yeah. little head. And this is one of those Twitter threads. It was from David Fickling, a uh, Bloomberg New Energy opinion writer for Bloomberg. Uh, he says that solar is on an unstoppable path to solve climate change. And this is something that he's he didn't know. He's not telling us that. He said he looked into it. He looked, talked to all yeah. the analysis and, and, and found out that Solar is is going gangbusters, and not only that, but it's enough to solve climate change on paper, yeah. and then some. Mm -hmm. uh, by 2050, this is where we have to get to by 2050, so there's more than enough uh, being built now, basically, to be on an easily on that path. Right now, when, you know, we think of the 2030s is when we have to get really serious and start, you know, putting heat pumps in people's homes and things, but as far as uh, the electricity grid goes and in, in the energy supply. He says the energy supply to solve the climate is already under construction right now. And it's enough, even if the current factories only run at 70%. So it's not like everybody's going at hundred percent and, you know, steam's coming out of the buildings and, and people are running around. It's like casual, <laughs> you know, 70% is nothing. Anybody who runs less than 70% is not profitable. So he says, I was absolutely astonished to discover this. The solar supply chain we need to reach net zero is already under construction. Current planned and under construction capacity for solar polysilicon industry uh, would be sufficient to support a solar sector producing nearly one terawatt of PV panels every year. That's one terawatt every year. <laughs> so new solar only generates about 20% of the time, okay? This is for reference. Uh, nuclear does about 90%, 50% for coal and gas, and offshore wind, which surprised me. I thought offshore wind was a bit better than 50%. And it's 35% for hydro and onshore wind, 35% for hydro. You know, I'm just, I always had, grew up with the belief that hydro was a constant. You know, they always say hydro yeah. is like a base power. But we're finding out with climate change and droughts, that it's not and also seasonal so it's it's not so this if if hydro is only producing 35 percent of the time of course pumped hydro works as battery storage because you just pump it back upstream uh you lose yeah. 20 percent of your energy doing that but it's a bad you know batteries lose something in the handoff too so yeah that's it makes yeah. sense pumped hydro is hydro that doesn't depend on nature even then uh this is one terawatt it's equivalent to 5.8% of annual global uh, electricity consumption. That's right now. Right. And most panel construction, production rather, is in China, so political issues could arise. But the gold rush on polysilicon will likely cause prices to crash even further. Uh, so this is very positive for the world. And, you know, uh, it's, it's hard for us to say that the technology and prices are going to solve climate change because... 
the people who are at the forefront of that um, are hopeful, but you know, it, it's, it's just hard to say that, but it seems like there is a lot of positive news. And this is basically the, the thesis of our podcast that, um, you know, prices and technology of, uh, you know, the, the prices of the technology we were talking about is going to change the world and perhaps save it. Yeah. Clean energy will win because it's better and cheaper. Okay, so um, high temperatures are making people angrier online. So this is another article from uh, Bloomberg. And uh, somebody did a study about when temperatures rise above 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit. And uh, hate speech increases on social media when the temperatures go above uh, 30 You're Celsius. Kidding. So this is maybe not <laughs> too surprising i mean people get hot and they get angry it actually makes me think of uh you remember do the right thing the great yeah. spike lee film from 25 years ago or so um that film takes place on the hottest day of the summer right. in brooklyn and and uh, uh yeah tempers start to flare because it's so damn hot um and so i don't know it's maybe just common sense but somebody you know did a study and this is a thing that you can measure you go on social media and you can evaluate the posts and uh, absolutely more uh, hate speech and bad behavior when uh, the temperatures rise and with climate change the temperatures are going to be rising more you know often. whenever there's the first hot day of a season or a hot day after a cold snap i find that people have road rage around here a lot like a <laughs> yeah, they're, they're speeding be. and they're, you know, I think the police should model on forecasts and other traffic enforcement. Brian, it's time for What Do You Think? What do you think? This is where I ask Brian what he thinks about topics that I am unsure of. BMW confirms it will adopt Tesla's 4680 cell format, pledging billions of dollars for six, six global factories. What do you think? Yeah, it sounds like a smart idea. Um, I, I wasn't sure everybody was going to adopt the, the Tesla 4680 cell. Um, I mean, it, it'll still be one of many, I guess. But, you know, it's a it's a very new form factor. So uh, interesting that other people Electrify are Electrify America is rebranding its 350 kilowatt and 150 kilowatt fast chargers. And the uh, one will be hyper fast and the other will be ultra fast. You know which one's which? I don't. Um, no. I think those names are useless because who knows what, what's faster, hyper or ultra? Tesla Solar now has to come with power walls. So if you buy t solar from Tesla, you have to get a power wall with it, which aren't cheap, by the way. There are thousands and thousands of dollars. Okay. I don't know why. What do you think about that? Why? What's what's the point of that? Well, I imagine it has to do with their, you know, um, limited ability to. They, they've had some difficulty expanding their solar. So, um, I don't know, they've crunched the numbers and they can only serve a limited number of people anyway, so they might as well do it the way they want to. Elon Musk still says that 6 billion Tesla FSD full self-driving beta miles driven by consumers like yourself are necessary for global regulatory approval. Do you know where they're at now? Like, what does that mean? I mean... It just means there's a yeah, lot of miles I, I, before it's going to work or, or what? Yeah, I'm surprised that there's any kind of a number attached to it. I mean, the, the main thing is the software's got to work. So who knows how many billions of miles they're going to need for... And they, they can't process all the data from all those miles. So, yeah, I'm not sure. All right, let's means. briefly dip into the mailbag, Brian. And also the lightning round is coming up later in the show where we'll skim through the rest of the week's headlines. Um, so it says, Dear Energy, uh, Dear Clean Energy Show, I am an autistic boy named, name withheld, uh, to talk about ammonia and hydrogen vehicles in your podcast. Uh, here are some videos about it. And he gave us about 90 links to YouTube videos. And I'm not even exaggerating. There is dozens and dozens of links that he gave, which was says great. And he says, Credit me under the alias Clazal Blano for giving you the suggestion and the research. Please, fame isn't for me. Have a nice day, gentlemen. Um, you know, that's one of the problems when people write into the podcast, Brian, is fame. It's it's instant fame <laughs> that you have to deal with. And fame is is not something for everyone. Uh, we understand that uh, it can be an issue. And it's, it's fleeting, fleeting. Fleeting, very fleeting. Uh, 
Hazel Blano, very flitty. Yeah, but I definitely want to know more about uh, ammonia and hydrogen. Those are both interesting possible uh, things that can be done green uh, in the Absolutely. future. Absolutely, and we will use some of your research and look at it, and we are hoping to know more and talk more and uh, have some interviews coming up as well, perhaps. So we like to hear from you. Contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We're on Twitter and TikTok. Hell, we're everywhere, Brian. Don't forget to, our YouTube channel and our SpeakPipe Clean Energy Show is our handle on speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. And now, of course, it's time for the lightning round. It's time for the lightning round, a fast-paced look at the week in clean energy news. And, Brian, this week, uh, this year, rather, Germany moved to a goal of 100% renewables by 2035. They doubled the goal for onshore wind, tripled solar goals, quadrupled offshore wind ones, all in the space of a few weeks. Thank you, Russia. Thank you, Putin. Yeah, that's working Under out the great. climate change file, unprecedented floods killed 1,400 injured 13,000 and damaged 1.17 million homes and destroyed another half million more and washed away livestock and crops in Pakistan, something we haven't mentioned on the show and is underreported in the news, perhaps. I We did mention it briefly uh, a couple of weeks ago, I know, but um, it's true. This is a massive, massive story. And, um, you know, all of our uh, thoughts to people in Pakistan dealing with that horrible tragedy. And it's time for a clean energy fast fact. Brian, a single Tesla mega pack, that is the truck size, uh, semi truck size utility mega pack, can hold enough energy to charge how many Tesla vehicles? 40. Just wanted to give you that fast yeah. fact. That's not bad. I mean, the battery packs in cars are pretty big. So that's, uh, yeah, that's good. From, to know. Elect from Electric Autonomy Canada, Toronto Fire Services, Canada's largest municipal fire department, is buying its first electric pumper truck. Unfortunately, it'll cost twice as much as a standard one, $2 million. What do you think of that? Wow. I mean, more upfront, but probably cheaper in the long run. That's usually how and these things they work. And they told Clean Energy, or uh, probably me, they told Electric Autonomy Canada, North American firefighters prefer something bigger and more traditional looking. Uh, in the fire truck department. Uh, so we decided that we were going to build a truck that looked and felt like a North American fire truck, which just sounds like it's overbuilt. And uh, it's just going to run on electric instead of diesel. Well, time for another Clean Energy Show fast fact. In 2020, 70 to 80% of lithium ion battery costs were raw materials this year. But in 2010, it was only 20 to 30%. So yeah, it's the the rest of the battery has come down. The raw materials not as much, but that just goes to show you that making a lot of batteries reduces the prices. From Bloomberg, the United States is estimated to host about a third of global crypto asset operations, and get this, it currently consumes about 0.9 to 1.7 percent of total U.S. electricity usage. Yeah, turn off your crypto in California when the power might go out, guys. That's the first thing you should start. Yeah. I don't... That's a lot. I mean, in a clean energy future, not a big deal. But uh, right now, uh, we don't Panasonic need scoped two potential sites in the United States, Kansas and Oklahoma, for a $4 billion investment in a new lithium-ion battery assembly plant, likely to support Tesla EV assembly in Texas. They initially selected Kansas, but after the big Biden bill, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, passed, they said, what the heck? Why not both? So they doubled it. <laughs> they doubled just like that. There you go. It's not a future. It's now. No more coal rolling. The EPA recently announced the levying of millions of dollars in fines against companies for selling equipment designed to circumvent pollution controls illegal under the Clean Air Act. And I say, God bless you. We don't want any more About damn coal, coal rolling. That is our time for this week. We like to hear from you. Contact us, as I said. Our email is cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Get out your typewriter now and send us a message. We're on Twitter, TikTok, um, Clean Energy Pod. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel because we are there in visual form. And you can leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. And we will mention your birthday on your birthday. And if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe <laughs> to our podcast because every week you get more of this great 
content. And God save the king. See you next week. Thank you.